Hello and welcome to Honey Badger Radio 62, Travel Horror Stories. As you may or may not know, I will clue you in, the, some of the badgers are still in London uh, following the ICMI, which is International Conference for Men's Issues uh, event, and we have some returning badgers, such as uh, Karen and Hannah. And uh, there's been some uh, some complaints that uh, Karen's got, and, and maybe Hannah a little bit. And you know, you guys love the Ransarker anyway. So we have uh, decided to cook you up a little travel rant situation here, uh, starring Karen uh, and Hannah. Uh, and uh, I will just let them take it away. Whoever wants to go first, uh, start complaining away. Karen, you go first, because I already complained about mine a lot. <laughs> oh, no, I, I've been doing nothing but complaining since I got home. Holy, holy fuck. Montreal. Never, ever, ever fly through Montreal. Never have a layover in Montreal. That airport is a fucking nightmare. Everything, everything you need to know is posted in teeny tiny little signs, right? Like, you, you literally, there is... You, it's next to impossible to figure out where you need to go. Half the people resent having to speak English to you, right? And yeah, and in order to actually make your flight, if you if you're coming from outside Canada, um, you have to go through customs and then go out of security and then back in. So you know, it, it's like yeah, now I get to freaking do the whole security thing again, and oh, oh my god. What a freaking clusterfuck. And the lineups at customs, unbelievable. Like, literally, there's this, you're on this, like, pedway above. You're one floor above. There's the escalator going down. And there's, like, 200 people waiting to go on the escalator to go down. And the entire floor, right, of all those little cattle run things with the, like, ribbon, right, that they, you know, herd you like cattle towards the slaughter, right, all of those completely fucking full, right, on that floor, and then there's 200 people waiting to just get down to the floor. Like, could they not put some more customs agents on duty? Like, could they not fucking think, okay, well, there's a lot of people that come through this airport, so we're going to open more booths? Like, what the fuck is wrong with them? Right? Heathrow was gorgeous. Heathrow boarding the plane, right? Uh, customs kind of suck, but uh, boarding the plane uh, to leave... They had that down to a fucking science. They were boarding this gigantic freaking international flight with like tons and tons and tons of people, and uh, and it was like it was it was seamless. It, it took no time whatsoever. Like they had it just down pat, and uh, and and yeah, like but Montreal just what a fucking nightmare. Question about that: Do you guys have TSA type uh, stuff? Uh, was there any kind of TSA type in Montreal? Is that only an American? Thing? No, no, no. T we have our TSA agents. I for, I don't know what they're called. Was here. there TSA at Heathrow? Yes. Interesting. Oh yeah, uh, no. You have to you have to go through security. You have to take off your belt and you have to take you know your laptop out of your bag and you have to. Yeah, I was to just uh, wondering if uh, that had to do with potential uh, holdback and uh, the other one working much more smoothly because, for instance, in the United States, uh, yeah, you have to take off your belt, your shoes. You can't have any clear liquids of any kind. Mm -hmm. And recently, I actually encountered. Um, Someone who somebody else's horror story where she got uh, oh and you also have to go through the scanner which used to like be able to see your genitals and all that but now they don't uh, supposedly but someone uh, that I know a sex worker they uh, they took out her business cards and they were looking at them and then they uh, pushed her up to the side to you know uh, pat her down and apparently one of the TSA agents patted her vagina about six times while the onlooker left. So I was just wondering how common that sort of thing is, if, if you guys experienced any sort of maybe gendered um, attention or if you just never ever saw anything like that and it, it's more of a um, you know once in a blue moon situation if it happened uh, at all. Um, well, okay, you're talking about when you go through security to get on a plane. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, no, I haven't ever experienced that. I did uh, get randomly selected at the Windsor Airport coming back from the first ICMI um, for, you know, I could I could have them, I had a choice, you know, we can do a pat down, we can do a swab of your hands, your waist, and your feet. Um, uh, There's a choice, that's interesting. I don't think I've ever encountered that. Or you can go through the, the bioscanner, right? And the bioscanner actually picked up uh, that 
like really horrible fucking bite that I had that necrotized on my back. It picked that up. Um, and it also picked up my sopping wet freaking pant legs because I got to the airport in the middle of a freaking downpour. And my pants were, my jeans were soaked all the way up to the knee, right? So it was like, so they, you know, they had to lift up my pant legs and look and see if there's anything in there. And I was like, I'm sorry, I haven't shaved my legs in a while. But, um, but yeah, and, and with the, at, um, fuck, where was it? I think it was in Montreal. He said that, you know, we're, we're just doing a swab of everybody, right? And, um, like, why would you do that when you got such a backlog, right? Why, why would you? Because it's just, it's just essentially, it's, it's not something that they do all the time, right? Like, they'll just choose a random person and do a swab, you know, for whatever reason. They'll choose a random person and say, okay, you have the choice to do the swab, the pat down, or the, the bio scanner. Um, that, that's my experience of it. Usually it's just, you know, really quick. Once you get to the front of the line and you, and you, you know, get your stuff on the conveyor, it's like super quick. It's just getting to the front of the line that is the issue, so. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a choice given uh, in our places. It's uh, very much, you know, of course they're very unfriendly and uh, move very, very slowly um, whenever I traveled up to Canada to see you guys. Uh, it was definitely quite unwieldy uh, TSA on the, on the American side. Uh, but I've never seen kind of a choice. It's always, uh, you know, come to the side, we're going to pat you down and do the scanner and do everything. So that, that's Oh, that's because you look suspicious. Oh. Yeah. I, I never look suspicious. I always just get chosen randomly to, you know, sort of test the equipment or whatever. Like, they, they always have told me, oh, well, you've randomly been selected. <laughs> Well, you know, to be fair, actually, yeah, I was wearing uh, a kigurumi, so it's a baggy onesie, and uh, the the person who had a kind of an unpleasant uh, experience with, uh, so they knew she was a sex worker um, to the point of she's actually also in an escort, so they knew she was uh, a sex worker, and uh, they patted her down, you know, allegedly uh, many more times than they should have, and they told her to wear tighter clothing next time. So uh, there is, seems to be some sort of uh, issue there with baggy clothing. Well, oh, yeah, you um, can you can hide things in baggy clothing. That's that's yeah. part of the problem. You know, I've I've never been patted down or wanted or well, I've been wanted once because um, I I forgot to take my belt off and it set off the the bell you know in the the scanner. Um, but I've never had any kind of gender detention or anything like that. I've never had anybody do anything that I thought they were doing specifically because I was female. Yeah, or anything really so been, Yeah, or anything, yeah, that I would be like, well, you don't really need to do that. But I remember um, right after the two terrorists in Russia used bra bombs to blow up that one plane, my one of my friends had to fly, and she had a really good point. Um, she was like, you know what, I'll strip naked if I have to to be safe on that plane so that it doesn't blow up while I'm on it. I would like to get where I want to go. And as long as it's not um, blatantly and overt bullying, as long as not like they did to that blind you know, half-blind girl that with with the brain damage um, that couldn't understand what they were saying to her and was obviously handicapped, you know, and that wasn't in my area, that was somewhere else. Uh, as long as it's not something like that or the time they took away a guy's Congressional Medal of Honor uh, as, as, as a potential weapon, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't really have a big objection. If I, if I go in there and they say, well, you can't have your crochet hooks, okay, well, I, I can get more crochet hooks, but, you know, I, I, this is nice to know that they're at least being, you know, really, really vigilant well, yeah. and in the Dayton area they're very very um, efficient so like you go in and the line doesn't stop and if they do have to pull somebody aside you know they don't it doesn't take them a bunch of time to get that taken care of they pull somebody aside they go through what they're gonna go through and as long as they don't find uh, you know some sort of contraband or some sort of uh, like, oh, for the people who are talking about the metal, they did give it back. He did oh, get that back. Uh, but, but yes, they had treated it as a weapon. And this was a veteran in a wheelchair. Yeah. Yeah, I understand a Congressional Medal of Honor is usually awarded posthumously. Uh, it's not something that usually gets awarded to people surv that, that, that survive the thing they did to earn it. Uh, but, but, yes. Um, well, and, of course, I have to there add that. 
there's an element of illusion as far as getting through, as long as you're not doing anything wrong. Yeah, but and, I mean, you're right, but what, what you brought up is a kind of interesting because there is an element of the illusion of safety since, you know, metals get taken away and you can't use toenail clippers, and yet you still, uh, at least this was in the past, maybe they've changed that, but you used to yeah, be able to take two matchbooks and a lighter on the plane for those people who want to light up as soon as they get off the plane. So it's kind of very arbitrary rules. You, you can't have the clear, you know, soap liquids, but you can have, you know, matchsticks. So it's, it's very, um, you know, I have my issues with it, but... Uh, you know, uh, well, a ma you, you know, a couple of packs of or boxes of matches aren't gonna bring a plane down. Um, and but but toenail cutters will. I mean, you know, it's like, what is this? This seems just so arbitrary. But yeah, well, they they actually they've relaxed all of that. I managed to bring my uh, my metal nail file and my toenail clippers, my fingernail clippers rather, um, with me um, on my, in my carry on. And my mom has gotten on with scissors, pointed scissors, no less. Um, you know, just explaining what she uses them for. She's like a 72-year-old woman, um, you know, white woman, and she's just like, oh, exactly. <laughs> you know, the last time I went across the border into the U.S., I was on a bus, and so I just never, I didn't take them out of my my travel bag. And, uh, and there were, you know, she called the TSA agent, called the manager over, and or the head guy over, and he said, oh, yeah, no, it's fine. So, I mean, like, they've relaxed a lot in terms of that, I think. Um, and uh, and as far as liquids go, uh, you know, you can have the clear soaps. You can have all of those things. They just have to be in small enough containers that they don't have to worry about it blowing a hole in the side of a plane. Right. It has yeah. a small yeah. amount in it, right? So, you know, and I can understand that. Um, well, and they do have to deal with stupid people, too, um, on occasion. And, like, they actually have to list on their website that you cannot take automatic weapons on the airplane and you can't take fireworks on the airplane, you know, uh -huh. they, they, you can't bring a, a container of gasoline on the airplane, nothing yeah. that's... Expensive. Pressurized container of <laughs> gasoline. Yeah, you can't, it's, there's a whole list of things on the site that I, I would never imagine thinking, like, even pre-9-11, I would not have for a moment thought, I could get away with taking this on an airplane, you know, yeah. no. Um, and, and they have to list that stuff because otherwise people will show up, oh, this is a souvenir, I want to take it on the plane. No, you can't take it on the plane. You have to, you have to check that or, or you can't take it on the plane at all. You know, you can't send it that way. Oh, and then they'll get mad and give, give them more of time. This propane tank has seventy value to me. Yeah. Well, you know, like I, I went uh, in, in 1994, I went to Japan as part of a sister cities program with my hometown. And, um, you know, one of the people in our group bought a katana. And, of course, the katana was checked, not carried on the plane. But, um, and my mother used, well, you can't take that on an, on the airplane as, as her excuse to not let me buy one. Uh, oh. But, uh, yeah, because she didn't want me to have a katana. Um, you check it. <laughs> It's fine, right? Like if you check, well, there's all kinds of things that you can check in your bags, and and they're fine for you to take with you. But you just can't bring as carry on. Yeah. Um, but oh, we had checked you're baggage. Taking... I mean, you don't go for two weeks without checking a bag. Also, unless you're taking your pets to Australia, that's or any fruits or nuts. <laughs> that's a huge no-no because of their uh, restrictions yeah. to the wildlife uh, preservation. Well, any country that you're going to, you have to tell them if you have fruits or nuts or vegetables or any kind of any kind of agricultural item, any kind of things like you 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 have to tell them because you could be bringing in bugs and yeah. you could be bringing in other microbes. You could bring bring in uh, fungus and stuff like that. So you really do have to be um, you know, open with that. It's courtesy to like not bring freaking pests into, especially into a place like fucking Australia where they got the rabbit problem and the cane toad problem, and and they already have enough pests. They yeah. have pests that can kill you. Everything in Australia wants to kill you. Uh, yeah, well, and it's I mean, very fragile, um, you know, uh, ecosystems where, as you yeah. pointed out, Karen, there's uh, they introduced one species and then suddenly that created such an imbalance that they had to introduce another species to deal with it, which also cause another imbalance and it's, it's a very tenuous system. That happens anywhere. That happens anywhere you introduce a, a foreign species. Ohio has this bug now. Thanks of all people to the EPA. Thank no. you EPA for introducing a biting, stinging insect with no predators to my state. You 
assholes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, the EPA introduced this bug because there was a, a plant that was migrating into Ohio, which they're, I think they were assuming people were bringing it, and it's possible that they were. Uh, but uh, so they introduced this bug, which is a natural predator for this plant, without thinking about the fact that the bug had no natural predator, and that would be a problem. Um, and the next thing we know, and it, it looks like a ladybug, oh. but, except it's uh, brown instead of red. Ladybugs do not bite. These no. guys do, and it's like this really annoying pinching feeling. <laughs> and I'm allergic to them, of course. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm like, that's one of my big pet peeves. Like, yeah. they tell everybody else, you know, don't move firewood, don't bring food from from uh, the, the East Coast to the West Coast with you, buy it when you get there, blah, blah, blah. And then what do they do? They yeah. introduce a freaking... And well, it, actually, the, the, the Zika virus was, um, was, was introduced, if I remember right to combat the spread of another virus. It was supposed to prevent m the, the mosquitoes, like when they reproduce, the baby mosquito would not live. And instead, the mosquito survived, and the virus is now affecting the babies of the women that the mosquitoes yeah. are biting. Well, you know, what, what I find interesting is what they should be doing is uh, what what they've done in uh, in certain places with mosquitoes is they they essentially have uh, bred a bunch of male mosquitoes to be essentially sterile, right? But still want to mate, and so half of the sex and then they just release them, and half of the sex that's going on between these mos mosquitoes is non-reproductive sex. Right, and the eggs that get laid are not fertilized. So maybe they could try that with your stinging ladybug um, imposters there in in Ohio, um, mm -hmm. you know, to control the populations at least. And also, you know, you like here when they spray mos for mosquitoes in Edmonton, they use uh, dehydrated flatworm eggs. Um, they just put them in water and then spray them into the ditches, and the flatworms. Uh, hatch and then they eat the mosquito larva and then when there's no more food they just die. Right? Uh, see my solution to mosquitoes is to put bat houses in all of the tall trees around your house. <laughs> yeah I could use a few of those but we don't have bats around here. Oh that sucks. I like bats. They are so cute. It sucks. I agree. They're adorable. You ever see their little, little faces soft up Soft slapping sound. Oh love them so much. Not that you'd want to bother them because they would defend themselves, but they are. Oh, ironically, fruit bats are uh, fruit bats are the ugliest looking ones too. So then the vampire bat bats are like cute. the fruit bats are the cutest ones. I think some of the animals that you think are the ugliest, like the ones with the big bulging eyes, and the, you know those are the cutest little things because they just look weird and vulnerable and stuff. But but yeah, I do. I, I like I like bats. East oh no, fruit bats are cute. I was totally house. wrong. My bad. Fruit bats are adorable. What was I thinking? They're like little dachshunds with wings. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're like little dogs with wings. Um, oh, hey, speaking of travel horror stories, I'm going to tell you my boyfriend's most recent travel horror stories because he went, he went to Orlando for a, con, you know, a, a thing um, just shortly. I, I, he left the night of the shooting. Um, and uh, But when he was coming back on the plane... <clears throat> there was this kid. The kid was just a little bit over two years old. That's the point where the kid needs to have its own seat and be belted in for takeoff and landing. Um, absolutely no exceptions whatsoever. And this kid, and it was like this white trash family, um, as he described it, right? The kid just blew a fit, right? An absolute fit. And so he's he's sitting there listening to this kid just freaking out, and um, so uh, they're supposed they've loaded up the plane. Everybody's on the plane. The doors are closed. They're taxiing toward the runway. The steward, uh, the flight attendant, has said this kid needs to be belted into uh, her seat, and uh, and the parents could not control this child, right? And they ref they refused to do it as long as she was kicking. I would have just freaking stuck the child in there, pinned it down strapped it in and let it scream until it, you know, freaking 
exhausted itself, but these parents weren't capable of, you know, actually doing that. And so they decided they were going to kick this family off the plane. So they got a taxi all the way back to the tarmac, okay? Halfway back to the fucking tarmac, the kid falls asleep, okay? But they're committed now. They're going to kick this family off, okay? So they got to go back to the tarmac. They got to attach the freaking gate, right, to the plane to get them off. Then they have to go and get all the checked bags off the plane because security regulations in insist that you cannot have a checked bag on the plane if you are not also on the plane because, you know, if I, were, if I wanted to put a bomb on a plane, I'd check a bag and fuck off. And then off. get kicked off, yeah. Yeah. So, so they had to, so it was another hour of them searching through all of the luggage in the cargo hold, right, to find this family's bags, right? By that time, they'd lost their weather window. There was a storm blowing in, right? And they could not, so this, these people were sitting on this plane for four hours, right, on the ground before everybody just threw up their hands and said, okay, well, fuck it, I guess you can fly out tomorrow. And so he gets off the plane and goes up to the customer service, right, and to get his meal voucher and his hotel voucher and, um, and get his new flight booked. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning, and they want him to fly, or no, it was about 11 o'clock at night, rather, almost. And they want him to fly out at six o'clock in the morning, and he's like, "Are you fucking kidding me? Right? Are you, you want me like I'm gonna get to the, I'm gonna I'm gonna use this meal voucher at the subway at the other fucking end of the airport, right? That's closing in ten minutes. I'm gonna pick myself up a fucking chopped chicken salad to bring back, and then by the time I get to the hotel, it's gonna be one forty-five, right? And then you want me to get up in two hours to come back here?" Right? Like, uh, no, you're not flying me out at 6 a.m. So they found him a flight at, like, noon or something like that. But, like, what a fucking debacle. Like, and these parents, why the fuck didn't they just sit their kid down, look their kid in the eye, say, you're going to shut up, right, and you're going to sit in your seatbelt, and you're going to be quiet? If it was a little boy, they would have. It might have been. There are some parents that just do not discipline their kids. Yeah. I've worked in retail and have watched parents come in with children that like Boys and girls. They're gonna they're gonna pull the shelves down on themselves and kill themselves. And the parents do nothing. They just yeah. oh yeah, that's you can't really do anything about it. You know? Well, yeah, a lot of that also comes from uh, the social punishment that parents uh, go through. Uh, it's they been a discipline. trope about parents spanking their children in a grocery store that's like seen as white trash or as you know too yeah. urban or whatever and so we actually have societally punished people for disciplining their kids in public which oh, well, is I, where I, they will act out the most because they know they have everybody on that well they instinctually know in a way they have gotten away with it in the past so it's like it's a place to tantrum uh, without yeah, I have a way much. of handling that myself you know like the tantrum thing okay so you got you got the little kid right looking at the giant uh, you know multi-piece candy bar that's that's actually a pound of chocolate that, that, that they they see that and it's got the same kind of wrapper as the regular size candy bar and the little uh, tear and share candy bar that they're allowed to have a section of at their age and they throw a screaming temper tantrum, stomp their feet, oh, what the big candy bar? My answer is to do the entire spaghetti limb herky-jerky dance right there at the child, just like the child is doing, and go, well, you can't have the big candy bar! Because my kid was smart enough to look up at me and go, Mom, don't do that. That's embarrassing. <laughs> and when I said, well, that's what you look like when you do it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that was the end of that. Didn't have to hit him. Didn't have to do anything. Didn't have to use any kind of force. I just embarrassed the ever-loving shit out of him and then let him realize that it didn't look any better if he was doing it than if he was watching it. And a lot of kids, you know, you just kind of got to gauge your child, figure out how they learn, and capitalize on it. You know, if my if my kid was like, I had a friend when I I've always had some friends when I was growing up that didn't have you know whatever gene or gland you have that makes you capable of becoming embarrassed. I've always had at least one friend who you couldn't embarrass them, 
you, you could drag them into a church, strip them naked, and put them in front of everybody in the church, and they'd be like sitting there wiggling their butt, going, "Ha ha! Everybody has to look at my ass when I'm in church." You know, they wouldn't care, you know. But you got you got to know what each person's uh, what each person's style is, and a lot of parents don't get in depth like that with their kids. I mean, when I was on the uh, the the first leg of my journey was a short flight from Ohio to um, you know, North or South Carolina. I can't remember which now. But in any case, there was a, a, a dad that had that approach where he, he you know paid attention to what his child's style was. And so he spent the entire flight thoroughly engaged, you know, verbally with this this preschool age child. We were talking they were talking about, oh, you know, now we're going to take off and it's going to make a jumping, you know, sensation and you're going to feel it feel it go up. You feel that in your belly? That's that's your your body reacting to the motion and everything and the kid's like, "Woo," you know. And and then you get up into the sky and dad's going, "Guess what? We're inside." a cloud, you know, and the kid is just like completely entranced. And the whole flight was like that. It was great. It was like listening to a parent read to their child, except instead of reading a story, he was making the flight a story for the child. You know, we're inside a cloud, we're above a cloud, we're in something that weighs tons and tons, and it's flying just like a bird flies, you know. And it was just neat little things like that. And they talked about the environment, and they talked, he, he taught her how to, taught, taught the kid how to yawn, and, and, um, and pop, pop, you know, your ears and everything. And it was great. It was just, it was a neat thing to listen to. And, that I've I've seen that in a couple of different flights that I've been in, um, where where you get uh, and it's mostly been dads, but some moms have done it too, where they the whole flight, they're quietly engaging with the kid so that they make the flight something very special for the kid, and the kid behaves the whole time because mom or dad and and it has been more often dad in my experience, is keeping them busy. And keeping them interested, and then they're not looking for something to occupy them because they're noticing their environment. And there were so many things about that that's that's neat because it's not just you know affecting the child's behavior and and you know giving the rest of the people on the plane the peace of a a flying with a child who's not screaming. There's also the fact that when you consistently engage your child in paying attention to their environment, you teach your child to always pay attention to their environment. So when your child grows up and they got to go out walking at night or they got to go um, you know, work in an environment where it maybe isn't entirely safe, they have that habit of constantly being engaged with their, uh, with, with their, their environment. So they're constantly doing the thing they need to do to keep themselves safe. Like that's the first thing you learn when you take a self-defense class is that you need to look around and be aware and pay attention to what's going on around you, know where the other people are and who they are and so on. So it was, it was really neat to see that and I was really um, kind of enchanted with the whole thing, the, 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 the whole listening experience because it reminded me, you know, growing up with my dad, that was the kind of thing he would have done too. Yeah, I there are some kids who are really like there were a couple of kids sitting right behind me on the flight back between Montreal and Edmonton and and um actually really really just you know quietly chatting and you know with their parents and and just being like reasonable little kids and these are like little kids 3 4 years old. Um yeah, no, it's it's nice to actually see that. It's nice to see good parenting. Um Especially when you know somebody's traveling, um, when you're like, because everything's an upheaval when you're traveling, and and everything's a little bit, you know, uh, a little bit up in the air, right? And kids can feel kids can feel really insecure um, when that's happening. Even though they're excited, they also feel insecure. And dog, go! <laughs> oh. There goes your dog dying again right in the middle of the show. Oh it does God. sound like an old man calling. <laughs> She's just she's awful. She's and she walks right up close to me to do it. Um, but That's because uh, you are her comfort. Yeah. I'm dying. 
Apparently I'm so, and then I yell at her and tell her to go away. And uh, but yeah, no, I I just uh, my my flight like I have issues with flights because um, like I don't know if if people notice this, but it's extremely rare. Uh, if you pay attention to my videos, it's extremely rare that I'm sitting the way normal people sit, um, like with you know my butt on a seat and my feet on the floor. Um, I I almost never sit that way. I, I who almost, does that? <laughs> I almost always, oh, I could never work in an office. I could never, ever, ever work anywhere where you have to sit in an office chair for any length of time. Um, I almost always sit in a half lotus or with my feet up or with my feet tucked under me or sitting on one foot with um, one foot on my chair and my knee up, um, something like that, because uh, the way my hips are jointed and also um, I have knee problems, I've had them all my life, uh, patellar femoral pain syndrome, sitting in uh, a movie theater seat or sitting in an airplane seat uh, is the absolute worst possible position that you can actually put yourself in for any length of time. In fact, even when I'm driving in a car, um, I move my, sh my seat forward and backward to change the angle that my knee's bent at for the gas and the brake and the other leg I often have my foot up on the seat and my knee up against the you know the door against the window the absolutely Karen yeah. high five me too yeah and because otherwise it's just like excruciatingly painful um, over the course of you know an hour it'll just be like oh my fucking I feel like somebody's stabbing my knees and it's not ready yet go away um, sorry my kids coming up to see if dinner's ready yet um, with a big grin on his face because he knows he's interrupting me during a show, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's like so between the flight and um, and then sitting in those uh, seats in the conference hall, right? Where I I actually pulled, I detached my seat from the others, moved it slightly away, and then sat uh, cross-legged, um, sat in a half lotus on the seat as much as I could, um, but. Uh, between all of that, like my my legs were so shot by the time I got home, between the flights and all of that, and uh, it, like one day at home I was feeling better, but holy shit, like I was in pain the whole fucking time. So yeah, that that's that's another thing about traveling that I hate is um is that I can't uh, I can't move, I can't change position enough, even even with like sitting in a half lotus, I would have to change position every hour in order to, you know, not be in pain, right? But sitting like a normal person is 10 minutes and I start feeling pain, right? So, yeah, that that's so that's not necessarily a travel horror story, that's a Karen horror story, so. Yeah, see, for me, the majority of uh, things that would be considered horror story type things for my travel, the majority of them actually happened before the day I was supposed to leave, um, and I like I, I think I've already talked about having, you know, the 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 airline with a week left to go changed my my uh, takeoff time for my my leaving flight to five hours earlier and put it during like I I was gonna work and then when I would get off work I would go straight to the airport. And get on a plane, and, you know, and go. That was my original schedule. I was going to go have just enough time to, uh, you know, even if they were slow for once, which they almost never are at Dayton. Um, but even if they were slow for once, I would have had just enough time, you know, to get through all of the things I needed to get through to get on the plane, and and go. And uh, they they when they moved it back, they moved it back to during that work shift. So I, I would not have been able to go on the trip. I'd have been screwed because it was it was a Fourth of July night shift, in in the U.S. where you're not going to get somebody else to take even part of that shift because it's it's Fourth of July night shift. And they don't want to work the Fourth of July. Um, so I I was pretty much going to be screwed. And I I called and I had booked through Expedia. Um, and I called, and I'm like, "This, this is a real serious problem. This is going to destroy my ability to take the trip." But I don't have money to to pay to change the flight. But I didn't change the flight to this. They did, and I got, 
you know, I got customer service and customer service gave me a supervisor and the supervisor just absolutely worked her ass off to make sure that I was able to can go ahead and make the trip and everything. So we were on the phone with uh, the airline all day, pretty much, like half half the day, um, trying to get this this done. And it's like I missed part of the show, so you guys all that listened to that that day's show all got to hear about it. Uh, but but she managed to do it. She managed to make it, you know, not cost me anything. I didn't really get anything either, but it didn't cost me anything to fix the problem. And uh, so I was grateful for that. But then. <laughs> Like 36 hours before I have to leave, we get this notice from my apartment complex that we had to move everything in the apartment that was up against the windows or close to the windows so that there, there, there was all three feet away or more from the windows. Now, when we moved into this apartment, we moved from a larger apartment and then shortly after, like a bunch of stuff that my parents had been keeping for me, they had to send it home uh, with me so that I, I could keep it here. So like all of a sudden, you know, my we we ended up with an apartment with double the stuff that you would want to keep it. Then like we look like hoarders, and we're slow. We've been slowly getting rid of stuff over time. You know, going through and you're like, well, we can live without that. Well, we can live without that. Well, so and so really needs one of these, and we're not using it. You know, and that kind of thing. But we still have a lot of stuff, and it's a, it, like I said, it's not a big apartment. It is, it is uh, not small. It's, it's, it's decent size, but it's not a big apartment. So every inch of space is being used, and we had to go through every room except the bathrooms and move half the stuff in, in those rooms and sort through things that, like, I had gone through it all like a hurricane trying to pack in the first place. And it's complicated by the fact that I'm a slob, so... I, I'm not all that well organized with things that I don't have to be organized with, and uh, that so that was like a mad scramble. Spent an entire day not getting ready, and and instead doing that. So of course I get back. It's been a week. I get back, um, and 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 it's not done. The windows are not done. So they didn't have. We, we they acted like we had to have this done that day because by the next day or the day after they were going to start changing all the windows in our apartment and uh, they, they're still not done in fact they're probably going to be doing them tomorrow you know, the, I, I worked two days this week or two nights I should say this week last night and tonight and so I got to listen to them hammer all day today so I've had like three hours of sleep and they're gonna probably come into my apartment tomorrow during the time of day when I would normally sleep and and change all the windows so I'm gonna have to be up during that too so talk about sleep deprivation, um, but that was with, it. Like come with reminiscing. Was, like, yeah, uh, something we just went through. I, I made a YouTube one of those story time popular things about it, where same thing. Apartment renovations. They're hammering all day, and we have a swing shift, so we sleep during the day. And it's like, well, there's no sleep today. Great. Yeah, <laughs> so, and oh, what well, on top of that, this is notice. yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, my ours was we thought we we're gonna move in August. Uh, for renovations, and basically they told us we put all our stuff into storage containers for two months, and then you stay at a hotel, they pay you, and then you move back in. And uh, we found out that not only is this not happening in August, but like right now, in the end of May, and we had like a month's notice uh, that it's happening altogether. And on top of that, we can't get into our storage bins for two months. You can't get in them at all. So you have to put all our stuff away, take whatever we can with us uh, to this hotel, and we're like, okay, we're just moving out of here, period. We're, we're done. The rent's increased. Uh, we don't care that there's renovations. This area sucks for the amount of rent that they're charging, so we're out of here. And now I'm in Sacramento, so there's that. Yeah, I was at, at when that happened, I was really annoyed. When I got home, I was even more annoyed by the fact that, like, here they had I had scrambled when I was trying to get ready for a trip, and then I get home and they hadn't actually done it. Like really, really not happy about that. Uh, but you know, it's 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 the way things go. Um, as as far as the rest of the trip went, you know, the the flights, my flights actually went fairly smoothly. the The worst thing that happened was the second leg of my trip there got there was a storm at the uh, the airport that I landed in at the end of my first leg, and um, 
they weren't sure if they were going to let us take off or not. So we had we had a delay, and then at the last minute they said we didn't have a delay, and then you get on the plane, and oh well, we do have a delay. But the upside of that was that the someone else's downside because they couldn't land because of the storm so they didn't make their connection uh, because those people didn't make their connection I had extra leg room for the flight to London uh, you know which it's a rotten reason to have extra leg room but it was still nice to have the extra leg room that actually is I don't care I don't care whatever as long as there's extra leg room yeah I don't care well, who has to suffer for it. It's you know I have extra legs, so you know. <laughs> Gotta make up for that somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that is awfully tall. It's the unfortunate part about the difference of uh, economy and business, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, one of the things they do is just allow you to actually fly comfortably, and uh, the markup is is quite egregious sometimes. So. Yeah, well, it, you know, they're talking about in two years from now, ICMI in Australia. And I'm, I'm just going to come out and tell them, you know, like, if you want me there, um, you know, uh, I'm flying business class. I'm, I'm not flying, you know, economy to Australia. It's not going to happen. I just want to know how much deep woods off I'm allowed to pack if I got to go to Australia with all the nasty spiders. I'm not a major arachnophobe. I just don't like the kind that you know puts you in the hospital. Yeah, but I don't think I don't think it goes off. Get it, it only repels no, mosquitoes and black flies. So um, yeah, I don't, okay. I don't I don't know that there's a spider repellent. No, there are, there is, but it's not something you'd want to put on your skin. You can buy it to put it around. And I know about this because my my mom actually has an allergy. So you know it's it's a it's just a major irritation. But we we put. We, we, we repel spiders at my mother's house. I kind of cultivate them at my house because I'm paranoid of mosquitoes. I absolutely hate mosquitoes. And, and I have good reason a mosquito almost killed me once. So, uh, yeah, spiders eat mosquitoes. Bats eat mosquitoes. So I actually happen to like having them around as long as, you know, they're not the type that you get very sick and have to go to the hospital when they bite you. For sure. Unlike California with the, with the black widows. But... From what I recall, uh, if I'm remembering this correctly, I believe a lot of the ins uh, insect repellents and specific insect killers that you buy in cans, like Raid, etc., are actually based on uh, Agent Orange, the, the nerve agent. So, uh, DEET. They've got DEET. And the ones that are effective have DEET in them. The, well, the ones that repel insects are based on DEET. Yeah. Uh, the ones that kill insects are based on neurotoxins. Yeah. So, But you'd never spray Raid on yourself. You'd only ever... Yeah you know, spray it into the wall of your head. Right. Actually, don't breathe those fumes is what I'm trying to say. 91% uh, yeah. isopropyl alcohol will kill most bugs as well. Uh, it's not a very nice thing to do to them, but neither is killing them with anything else. Yeah, any um, kind of slow death. Yeah. It's, uh, well, lem it's lemongrass, actually. Death. You're talking natural stuff. Uh, lemongrass sprays uh, tend to be uh, effective for uh, some bugs. Suffocates them. Actually uh, growing lemongrass as well. And neem, uh, neem um, trees and neem oil is also a really good one. So here's another horror story from my travels. Apparently, and I was talking to my boyfriend while I was in London, and he said that the kids were keeping up with the dishes, and they were taking out the garbage, and they were keeping the kitchen clean and, and all of that. And that all came to a screeching halt the night before I arrived home when they decided that they were going to watch a Gordon Ramsay video, and they were going to buy a chicken and buy... Uh, things for like to stuff the chicken with, uh, to put up its butthole, <laughs> as my uh, my oldest would say, butthole, and and they were gonna cook this chicken, and uh, make make the stuffing, cook this chicken, bake some potatoes, make a big huge like actual meal, right? This is sort of the, for the first time ever um, that they've they've actually done this, and um, and then they didn't clean any of it up, so. Um, and on my dishwasher, we we didn't manage to get it hooked up before it, it arrived the day before I left. We brought it home the day before I left, and I was going to go out because the it didn't have the compat it didn't have compatible parts or didn't look like it did um, to hook to the tap. There's a little connector that you have to put onto your faucet in order to be able to hook the dishwasher hose onto your faucet. 
So there was no dishwasher while I was gone. Um, I get home and then I, you know, managed to. Uh, I was just like, you know, I'm I'm not going to wash all these dishes by hand. Fuck that. Um, so we loaded up the dishwasher, and then I uh, I I went to the um, the Home Depot with my little connector and a picture of my faucet, and he pulls one of the O-rings out of the little connector, right? And he's like, see, there's threads on the inside, too. And I'm like, fuck it, motherfucker, right? Because there's two O-rings, you know, depending on whether you have a male fitting or a female fitting, and I'm like, fuck, so I didn't even have to buy anything. I could have hooked it up in, like, two seconds, right? Had it running the whole time I was gone. I was, you know, I was, I was happy that I didn't have to buy a part or a new faucet, but I was annoyed that... I didn't notice that before I left. I didn't notice it before I left because my boyfriend came up to me and said, I need you to do me a huge favor the night before I left. Instead of going and dealing with this problem with the dishwasher, I need you to do me this huge favor. I've got these 17 PDFs with all of this stuff that all needs to be manually input into spreadsheets. And, uh, and you know I can't do it because I'm dyslexic. And I'm like, just write a script to import the data. And he's like, there every one of these 17 PDFs is formatted differently, so I would have to write 17 different scripts to import the data. And I'm just like, oh my fucking God. So it's three and a half hours of mind-numbing clerical work that I did for him because he he wouldn't be able to do it because it would be full of typos and all kinds of fucked up shit. And um, so that's what I did instead of packing and getting ready and getting my dishwasher working and all of that. And, uh, you know, it's helpful helps him earn money. I'm happy to do it. It was just really bad timing. And it had to be done by the next day. So, yeah, that that's that that was my lead up to the trip was having to do that and uh and not hooking my dishwasher up and getting it working. So, but it's working now. I'm happy. Well, at least why it's working once you get back. Yeah, so it's 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 working now and and it's beautiful. I love it and it makes me happy to have a dishwasher. And it's not even so much the washing dishes by hand. It's the fact that when you don't have a dishwasher, your entire kitchen turns into a staging ground for dirty dishes. Yeah. yeah. So been there. I our old apartment didn't have a dishwasher. Uh, you know, we lived there for three years before we moved where where we are now. And uh, yeah, the old apartment had something else interesting too. Um, you know how if you run water and you put soap in it and you let it sit overnight, it'll get slimy. You know, um, our hot water with nothing added to it, if you let it sit overnight and get cold, would be like you had put dish soap in it and let it sit and it would get this like sliminess to it and everything and that was we were kind of glad to move out of that place ew and that was kind of gross we we never did figure out what was wrong with uh, with that location that 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 water was like that um, but yeah that was that was really gross yeah, I have a similar, uh, a little bit story in, uh, in Memphis when we lived there uh, for like six years, five or six in that one apartment, and uh, yeah, no dishwasher as well. But then again, I, I grew up without a dishwasher, so that wasn't a big deal. Uh, but of course, once moving to America, you, you get used to it, and it's very um, helpful. Uh, and my parents and I had uh, one when I lived with them, but then when I moved out to college in Memphis, uh, that particular apartment was a bit too old. And, of course, there's phantom weird smells, no dishwasher. But uh, then we moved to uh, East Bay, uh, the Bay, San Francisco Bay area, and uh, not the well, dishwasher was there, so that was good. But the water, uh, something was going on. In fact, I think one of my cat dragons got, um, what is it called, uh, crystals, urine crystals, because he just wasn't drinking water. Uh, he just didn't like it. And uh, we left some water boiling, and I accidentally forgot about it. And uh, it was just water from the tap. Uh, possibly actually through the filter as well, because we, we got one of those early on. The water was so bad uh, tasting. And the filter, water was fine, everything great. Put it in a pot, let it boil all the way down accidentally. And when I got back to it, there was a pebble the size of my pinky thumbnail, like pinky nail. It was a big-ass pebble just of, of gray stuff just sitting there, and that's the concentrate of minerals or whatever that was in that water that boiled off. And uh, that was a bit disturbing. It was, it was a, little, a little weird. And I'm glad to be moved out of there altogether. Sacramento you know, we, is so much uh, better. 
we had gotten to the point in that apartment complex, like just the the initial taste of the water when we first moved there, we we're like, okay, we're gonna buy water, and and we did. We we didn't drink any water that that came out of the tap there. Um, well, that's what you have to do in Vegas. We uh, we actually moved from Memphis to the Bay Area through Vegas. We lived there for about two months uh, with with a couple of friends of ours, and the water there is uh, full of chlorine and. God knows what else. I don't quite remember everything that it has to the point where if you want to drink water out of the tap, you can't, and you can't even use filters uh, unless it's the four hundred dollar kind where you know you like hook it up with a bunch of hoses and it's like has its own separate area because it's so heavy. And then uh, your well, we had, think you're making drugs. <laughs> well, everybody has them because the water in Vegas is just unbearable, um, and everybody just goes. Actually, what everybody does is to go to Walmart and buy those big gallon things of water and uh, it's just it's very interesting there's a lot of information about Vegas in general that uh, it's called, she's called the the water witch and she was the uh, the woman who was in charge with uh, using a lot of the um, I forget what they're called but it's a, it's a way to get like permits to get water siphoned off the Colorado River to Vegas to maintain their expansion and growth and actually uh, it's it's unfortunate because it's one of the reasons why California is having drought uh, because the uh, Vegas area has claimed a lot of the uh, Colorado River runoff type stuff for itself and uh, California is suffering a little bit uh, since it produces about 60% um, or 65% um, or more of the United, entire United States um, food supply. Uh, there's a massive amount of it that comes from California and um, so we kind of need that water for, for the agriculture here, but uh, because of the, the growth of Vegas, that's basically in the middle of the desert, there is no water, and that's why she's called the Water Witch, because she uh, was very aggressive in, in getting those permits uh, to go to Vegas instead of anywhere else. And so it's just interesting that uh, the place that is actually growing food and needs that water is not getting it, while Vegas is getting it, and they're not really producing anything but gambling debt, and uh, their actual water tastes awful there, so they have to supplement with, with water from the stores or by filters, so I just find that uh, that interesting. It sounds to me like that is definitely not a place to have a conference, <laughs> although people do. People seem to have conferences there all the time. Um, it's but a great place to visit for about a week at most, but living there, I would absolutely not recommend it. You end up seeing too many sad people. It's just, uh, it's it's actually kind of depressing. Uh, living there has been like, everybody uh, is sad, and there's uh, gambling machines and, like, gas stations and grocery stores, and it's just uh, a little ridiculous. So, like, the opposite of what we saw in London, because everybody we ran into there seemed to be pretty happy. So, of course, a lot of the people we ran into there were at the conference, but... Uh, well, it's good that they were uh, they were happy instead of, you know, because it's difficult, it's a daunting uh, process, uh, and not just men's rights, but specifically men's rights. It's, it's not exactly easy. Uh, and you're not exactly loved by everyone, and so that, that's mm -hmm. good. Oh, it was interesting. Uh, we only had one person that seemed to get a little bit out of sorts. There was a there was a chick that was uh, working in the facility where we we had the conference that didn't like listening to Karen uh, Karen's anti-feminist talk, and um, but yeah. she didn't do anything. She did well, not, to her credit, she did not do anything. She just sat there and looked dour. And yeah, everybody yeah. else somebody, that we worked with, said, if, very... if, if you go get coffee, don't get it from the blonde woman. <laughs> probably spitting it. Um, yeah. you know, like particularly when I said to the guy who's like, "Any advice you can give my friend who's about to get married?" And I was just like, "Ah, oh, like don't, no, not now." <laughs> um, you know, because my advice would be, "Don't get married," right? Like, um, essentially, when uh, it's not even it's not even good in terms of. You know, like now he's secured a sexual partner because statistics show that after marriage, compared to cohabiting, um, you end up having less sex. You know, just the average couple, right? Most couples end up having less sex after the woman has locked the man into a marriage, right? She, she, I, and I, I think I put it this way: uh, she, she doesn't think she has to do any work to maintain the relationship now because it's, it's now on paper. Right, and so when you when you were just living together, she felt like she had to do some work to keep you. So you know you got blowjobs and stuff, right? And now you know that that's probably going to taper off a little bit because she doesn't feel like she has to do it to keep you. You're locked in. You you by a contract, and so yeah, no, your poor friend. My condolences, right? 
Um, and apparently she was just like, you know, like just shaking her head listening from the other room. <laughs> and like just with this disgusted look on her face. And I was like, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You know, like this is just the reality of, of what life is for people. And uh, provable reality, not just through lived experiences, but through statistics. Yeah, you know, just like just like the statistics, the the studies that show that the more, it's not so much the more around the house a guy does, right? But the more traditionally female chores a guy does, and it it's probably not every single couple that this happens, but on average, you know, statistically, the less sex he's going to have, and it's I think it might have to do with whether he's doing it because his wife is like nagging him to do it and he capitulates um, versus if he just enjoys it. If, if he just enjoys or he's neurotic about cleaning or whatever, right? I mean, I know some guys who are, who are really neurotic about the place being tidy and they will take it upon themselves. Uh, their wives aren't nagging them. Their wives aren't demanding it. They just do it. Those guys probably get plenty of sex, right? But the ones who only do it because their wives are like nagging and pressuring and you know and guilting them to do it, I'm I'm guessing that the capitulation on the part of men, particularly on the part of men who already do plenty, who already put in similar number of hours a day in paid and unpaid work, you know, just going to work, commuting, coming home, cutting the grass, repairing the doorknobs, uh, replacing light bulbs, um, you know. Things like that. Um, when well, there, there could be another reason too, though. Yeah. It could be that the guys that are doing traditionally female chores are doing them because they're 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 sharing housework and they're sharing in the wage earning. And there are a lot of two income households where, like the the women women are now starting to do more overtime. Women are starting to take more, you know, second shifts, or they're working opposing shifts from each other. So maybe he works first shift and she works second shift, but that means he cooks supper and does the dishes. So he's doing uh, traditionally female tasks, but then they're never home together. So how do you get something started? You know, if if you get to 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 be two ships passing in the night for half half the time, yeah, um, or yeah. if if it was like, you know, we we actually had to, you know, go out on dates and make arrangements and stuff when I was doing three jobs and my husband was working full time and going to school full time, you know, we had we had very little time together, yeah. and both of us did. Like I'm, I've been learning to work on the cars, and he he's always been, you know, able to do all of the housekeeping and stuff that he wanted to do. You know, or even if he didn't want to do it, you know, this is there's the gender thing has never been a thing for him, um, and so you know, it's I, one of those things. It may be a time issue as well in some in many many families. I think a lot of it too might have to do with um, like women, uh, women and their high their sort of hypergamous uh, tendencies uh, as far as. You know, like I was reading, oh, it was was it in the Telegraph or something like that, or the Guardian? Um, it was a new a story about how an increasing number of women in the UK are, you know, uh, primary or sole breadwinners now, and they don't like that. It feels like a lot of pressure for them. They do not like being the one who is the primary or the sole person who is keeping the roof over everybody's head, and uh, I think that that might cause uh, a certain amount of resentment if their husband, even if he's contributing around the house to make up for it um, with domestic chores, uh, the fact that she's now put in that position that she's not happy in, and so many of them, uh, the majority of these women that they surveyed just were not happy in the position of being the primary or sole, sole breadwinner, um, she may just end up resenting the fact that he's not working. And I see this all the time. I mean, my boyfriend was just talking to a friend of his um, on the phone, and and you know, like the guy married a woman who was making one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. Of course, because of hypergamy, he married a guy who was making one hundred and fifty. They bought a house based on their combined incomes. Then they had a kid. Then she didn't go back to work for two years. Then when she went back to work, when he talked her into it, right, because he had to work twice as much to make up for the difference. 
Um, when she finally went back to work, it was part-time, so she was no longer in an administrative position, so she was earning less per hour and working fewer hours, right? And he's working essentially like 14 hours a day, he's constantly out of town uh, on site uh, in order to bring in the amount of money. She doesn't want to downgrade their house, she doesn't want to move into a cheaper place, mm -hmm. she wants the lifestyle that she wants. And then she will and hold it against him that he spends all that time away from home. He complains that he's not available. Exactly. And, and mm -hmm. he, he's like, here's how he put it. You know, this really sucks. I never get to see my kid, and I never get to see my wife's vagina. And she'd better start showing me her vagina or she's going to have a cheating husband. You know, women who, who do resent being in the breadwinner position, I think it, it, to, to me they weren't raised right. You know, when I was in that position, I was proud to be doing it. Uh, that 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 I was able to, you know, step up and be just as just as capable in that that area and and actually take care of business. Oh it yeah, that's really, like there was no resentment. I was I was kind of it was hard and it was there was a lot of stress and a lot of pressure involved and everything. But underneath all that, there was this uh, sense of being able to do something for my family that a lot of women don't do. Yeah, I was uh, raised similarly too because I was kind of a running joke uh, between Richard Grawl and I that uh, I would always say I can do that myself, you know, because I, there's a need or, or whatever the way I was raised, uh, there's I wanted to prove that I can do it too. What curious to me is how does this uh, acknowledgement and realization of stress of being the primary breadwinner breadwinner does not turn into empathy for men? How do we yeah. not? How do they not see that's like oh. That's what the patriarchy has to deal with. That's why men have issues. Like, how does that not translate? Solipsism. Yeah, good answer. It's pretty much. Yeah, I think so. I think you know it. It really is just sort of a because I mean, like back when, like I've said before, back when men got the kids and they got the entire financial task of feeding and sheltering them, that was called male patriarchal privilege. And now when women get the kids and they get child support and maybe alimony, that's misogyny because, you know, it's society treating women as if they're only good for child care, even though there's no woman in the world who has to demand sole custody of the kids. Go, dog! Well, yeah. and even though it was a woman who, yeah. who feminists call her a feminist um, and everything, it's Norton, a woman yeah. who fought for that. Yeah, you know, no. It was, it was women who fought for this. It's not something that the, some patriarchy imposed on women. No. Women fought for this. Yeah, and and you look at you look at too the uh, the idea of being the the breadwinner. Um, you know, feminists have always framed that as men being able to go out and be fulfilled in a public life, right? A life and be be economically empowered and all of this stuff, right? And yet when women have to deal with it, they 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 kind of uh, unilaterally, they uniformly object to being put in that position. That's too much pressure, right? And even even freaking Gloria Steinem, right? In that interview from about five, ten years ago, right? The, the interviewer said, are women still oppressed? And she says, yeah, they're more oppressed than ever. And he's and the interviewer's like, why? And, and she says, well, because they have to balance, uh, you know, work and childcare and home and they have to, you know, and they feel pressure to earn and, you know, they feel pressure to be economically independent and all, like, so all of these things feminism pushed for, right? Now those are the new oppressors of fucking women. Yeah, well, and feminists have this problem. Feminism. Feminists have this problem of you know, women who who they say are supposedly equal to men or who are supposedly able to do all the same things men can do are are oppressed if after going out and doing the same job a man is expected to do and getting the same pay a man would get, you know, if they have to buy their own shit. Yeah, if somebody else doesn't. I mean, somebody else being the government using your tax dollars doesn't buy it for them. Yeah. Well, I mean, look. Let's look at the evidence. The Harvard Business School has uh, done research that showed that women uh, are in control of the 92 percent of household spending. Period. They're in control of the money that both the husband and the wife bring in. So, who is the true head of household here? Come on. And well, I mean, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's a, I, I just want to put. I just want to state that that's a deceptive figure. Mm -hmm. When taken in isolation, it's not like women have 92% control and men have 8% control. Most of the decisions on how money is spent are joint decisions. Uh, most couples both have control over 
what house they're going to buy, what car they're going to buy. Well, this was specifically household spending, I believe. Yeah. So within, within and, um, and household spending too, right? I mean, she's not okay. She's she's buying shampoo, but she's buying shampoo for him. She's you know, like it's not like she's spending all that money on herself. Right. And right. it's not like she's buying shit that he hates. But right? she's a decision maker. Is kind of my point here. Uh, more or, than or she's else. the one who who you know hands the money to the cashier and brings home the stuff, right? And he's the one who says, "Well, I feel like sleep tonight." Oh, so and you mean like a more relegated task is what you're saying? And she's yeah, the one so that decides if they can afford steak or bologna when she's at the grocery store, though. You know. True. True. But I mean, she's the one who does the shopping, right? And that right. that was the position that I was in. I was the one, and I am the one at the moment. Like you could, you could actually say that I control 100% of the spending in my household because but you actually have empathy for the men in your life, and so you <laughs> make more adequate decisions. Than well, me. he's he's always the one, and I keep telling him he doesn't have to do this, but he's like, I I'm gonna buy this, I'm gonna spend this, you know, I'm gonna, I'm and I'm I'm just like, why? He's just, I'm. You don't need to ask me. You know, or or check with me. He says, "Well, I just want to make sure that you know it's in the budget mm -hmm. before I do it, um, because he doesn't keep track. He hates keeping track of that. I keep track of it all, and um, yeah, same in our family. Yeah. So I mean, it's just, but that doesn't mean that I'm controlling what he spends or that I, you know, dictate to him what he can spend his money on." Or, you know, well, I think I think you're more of a minority in, in that sense, but I bring it up just to uh, bring up a Bo Burnham joke from a bunch of years back. He said, uh, "For every dollar that a man makes, a woman makes seventy cents." That's not fair. The man is only left with thirty cents. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. You know, the budget thing when it comes to, uh, to 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 families like that. A lot of times, families do have that discussion. My parents were like that. My husband and I are like that. Like. We don't necessarily discuss, you know, whether or not we can afford a cappuccino, where our budget's not that bad anymore. But I, for instance, wouldn't go out and and just buy a camera um, with money from our budget without discussing it, you know, with him. Find out if we can afford that, and if it's a, you know, going to be a purchase. What am I going to do with the camera? Am, am I going to make money for the family? Am I getting something that we can all use? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and and the same is true with with items of equal you know, equal value, he wouldn't do that either. You know, when we talk about getting a car, we both talk about getting the car, even if only one of us is going to drive it. It's not something that, when you're in a family like that, you have to be able to do that because you do have one budget, even if you have two incomes. You have one set of things that you absolutely have to, to make sure that you're covered for, or you're going to be homeless, or you're not going to be able to keep one of the jobs that pays the bills, or things like that. So it's, I agree it is a kind of a deceptive statistic when you say you know, women control, have that control, because it's not necessarily control. A lot of times they just are the ones, you know, signing the money over or, or, or handing the money over and things like that, when in, in fact it's actually been a joint decision. But when they go out and, and do the grocery shopping, it is the woman that, that's the steward of the family funds and everything. And I've watched different types of women come in and went to, to, to the places where I've worked in retail and behave very differently with that that task and that that trust. Like I've seen women come in, you know, I've like if you collect uh, baseball cards or if you collect Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh cards or any other kind of you know Magic the Gathering, any of those, you you get these big notebooks, big uh, binders full of plastic card carrying wraps, you know, that they they're they're sheets that have pockets for the individual cards. And I've seen these women come in with those things like two inch thick, full of coupons. And they're organized. They have their list and they'll come in and they'll buy 150 bucks worth of stuff. And by the time they get done with all the various types of coupons that they hand over, you know, that they, they hand over a few bucks and all those coupons. And and that pays for for the purchase and everything, and I've seen women. It's just like that's their career. They are almost like professional couponers, and uh, and that's one way of stewarding that money. And then I've seen women come in and they just throw that money around left and right and buy you know fifty bucks worth of makeup and eighty bucks worth of hair stuff and everything, and then they have a few bucks left to buy you know groceries <laughs> and stuff like that. And it, it just it runs the gamut. 
Oh yeah, it does. And you know, like I, when when my uh, friend in BC uh, had she had to go on welfare when she came back from her um, uh, debacle in the United States, uh, six months pregnant, and uh, so nobody's going to hire her. And why would she try and get a job if she's just going to have to go on maternity leave two months later anyway, at the at the latest? Um, so she's applying for welfare, and they uh, they tell her how much money she's going to have. She's got a four year old. She's she's pregnant. She's got to get an apartment and all of this. And she's like, that leaves me with under two hundred dollars. And this is in a town where everything's expensive, right? Like here at in Edmonton at the time, a gallon of milk was three dollars and eighty three cents, and in that town it was over six dollars, right? So. Everything's very expensive because it's isolated and it's far away from everything and you, you have to haul everything up. It's hugely expensive to buy groceries there. She's like, how am I going to feed myself and my child on this? And I was like, oh, honey, you come shop with me and I'll show you how, right? And and she made it. She had money to put away every month. Um, and that that's sort of what you have to do. You have to realize that uh, and being frugal um, because, you know, back when I was married, um, you know, we were always technically under the poverty line and significantly under the poverty line. We had three kids and two other kids that we were paying child support on. And, and um, so it was, it was always scraping by, always, always, always. And we managed. And one of the reasons we managed was because I got into specific habits as far as uh, spending, like, my, my kid my youngest when he was four and he you know he couldn't read at that point but he could do he, he recognized numbers and he recognized prices and so I'd take him into the grocery store and uh, and he would go to the aisle with the fruit roll-ups and the rice crispy squares and stuff right and he'd he'd be like mom 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 fruit roll-ups are on sale because he'd see the little tag on the uh, sticking off of the, the shelf and I'd say oh for at, oh, they are, and then he'd get there and he'd look and he'd and he'd look at me and he'd be, he'd say, "Oh, not on sale enough, right?" <laughs> <laughs> at age four, he knew he knew how much I was gonna pay for something like that. Well, that's the thing too. I think that's one of the differences between the older generations and the newer generations in terms of uh, how women are um, or treated or trained or whatever. Where uh, you, for instance, and Hannah came from a place, well, and me too, growing up in Second World Country, we came from a place where, uh, well, me less because I went to America early enough, we come from a place where uh, you had to work for all your money. And that is not really the case a lot of times uh, in a gynocentric society where, where women are given free passes, they're given free things, they're given free drinks, they're given their boyfriend's money. And so I think a lot of that lack of uh, frugality comes from the, they do not know the value of money uh, at all whatsoever. And they don't have to work hard jobs too, because once I started working, I was like, "Oh, this thing that I wanted to spend this amount of money on now, this is I'm seeing this as my life time. This is the time of my life that I put into this money. Do I really want to spend it on X?" So I, I think uh, an interesting thing to do would be to convert dollars into hours and minutes, and to see how much of your life you are actually spending. On oh everything. yeah, totally. Where there is, is is where there is a significant difference. Um, and and spending between men and women that I have noticed just from working where the items are sold um, is is in grooming and and presentation and stuff. You know, men men buy things to look nice. They always you know they try to look tidy. They try to look professional and things like that. And, and women spend even, 300 you know, There's even hair dye and beard dye and everything. But yeah, women will spend three hundred dollars. Literally three hundred dollars on a hair dye to turn it silver. It's like just and, wait and fifty crazy. years. It's crazy. <laughs> And, and like I've seen women come in and and they'll buy you know uh, so many different types of lipstick or so many different uh, eyeshadows and so many different hair hair colors and everything and you know, it's like you have one pair of eyelids and one set of lips how many different shades of lipstick and eyeshadow do you need uh, and, and it's 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 crazy and they'll spend this money and I I remember from trying out modeling I remember learning that some of these things you don't get to use it up uh, you keep it for a few months and then if you have used it then it's got bacteria in it and it, it, it can actually cause you problems especially the eye stuff you can get an infection in your eye 
from continuing to use eye makeup after a couple of months of having it and, and pu putting the uh, applicator on your face and then putting it back in the makeup and so you have to throw it out and buy new so you're constantly wasting this stuff and it comes in containers and the containers oh, yeah. are getting wasted and they all end up in the landfill and all this and and I well, look it's, at this it's worse than that it, uh, as a model waste? not even a model but a girl uh, buy it's, it's it's a horrible waste because you also have to uh, when you go to the grocery store and there's the you know the the brand name stuff which is like double the price of the non name brand stuff so you're like well why would I spend all this money I'm just going to get the cheaper grocery brand. A lot of times you buy a few of them because they're cheaper and you buy like three of them to equal the price of the bigger one and it's actually crap. It does actually end up being horrible. You don't use it. The colors don't match. You got it just because it's, it's like candy for adults. And, and then when you are like, okay, fine, next time I'll just buy really expensive stuff and save it and all that. But there's honestly, there's really no quality check in some of these really expensive brands. A lot of times they end up getting by just on hype and uh, you know, like Jeffrey Star, because he's you know a really well known half cross dresser or whatever he is, and they're like, oh man, no, I'm gonna buy his lipsticks, and it's like, yeah, except it's no different than something you could get for half the price. So there's just so much lack of regulation in, in the, I don't not lack of regulation, but lack of actual um, uh, quality checks, and a lot of it is uh, hype and like, oh, not not Jeffrey Star, but Kylie Jenner is actually the one. You know, no, the what the really? Fashion thing. And what really gets to me like candy. What really gets to me is a lot of the women buying this stuff. Like I can understand if you're using it professionally. If you're if this is part of your job, it's one thing. You know, you, you make money using this. It's like just like I wouldn't go out and buy a new camera right now. I'm not making money with my camera. I'm not doing it professionally. It would be a frivolous purchase. Uh, I wouldn't go out and buy a new lens. I wouldn't even go out and buy a cheap flash right now because it would be a toy for me. You know, it would be a hobby for me. It would be a frivolous purchase. Even though I've done it professionally, even though I'm very good with it, and it is a, um, you know, it, it's, it's like breathing for me taking pictures, I wouldn't go out and make that purchase because it's it's it would be a frivolous purchase. But for the everyday woman, the woman that just, you know, her her makeup is a choice, something that she gets to, to make herself feel good, um, that is a frivolous purchase that a lot of women spend a few hundred bucks a month purchasing their makeup, their hairspray, their special shampoos, which by the way you can get by with uh, the, the, the Dove body wash that's supposed to be hypoallergenic in your hair. It's cheap. You use it all over and, and it does no harm whatsoever and then you don't need all that expensive shit. Um, but I, I only know that because I'm allergic to all that expensive shit, you know. Yeah, that's what they call the pink tax, right? That the girl stuff to, uh, costs Except more. Except it's, like, it's well, not. You don't have to buy it. You don't yeah, have to buy it. It's not a tax. It's oh, a, a choice. You guys want to hear the most appalling fucking story ever? When I first started working at the Tony Romas here, I'm no longer working there or anywhere else outside the house at the moment, but when I first started working there, there was this girl there it was actually the girl that I talked about in uh, my nice guy video. Uh, I think I called her Jane in that video. Anyhow, she, her boyfriend, who, who was a jerk but had lots of money, um, okay, she comes in and her hair is just all different. It's all completely different from normal. And everybody's like complimenting her and everything. She says, my boyfriend took me to... I don't. I forget the name of the place, but it was like right downtown on Jasper Ave, right? So like a really, really high end salon. Cost him eight hundred dollars to do her hair, eight hundred dollars, and she was unhappy with it. She didn't like it. Wow. Yeah. Eight hundred. I, I could give her a haircut. She wouldn't like for free. Yeah, I know. I got my clippers. Right clippers here. upstairs. <laughs> yeah. Uh. That's the thing is that uh, women are not held accountable for uh, appreciating anything. Uh, there's no, no no culture of thankfulness, and that's something that's actually one of the things that uh, my partner really valued in me is because I came from you know a second world country where uh, we that's kind of a survival mechanism to be yeah. satisfied and thankful for the little things. And uh, you know, I just I think a lot of uh, modern women need that. Well, I mean, you you have an you, you have an interdependence on your man when you come from a place where you're you're not uh, where there isn't a whole lot of money. 
to go around, um, and that you where you do have to struggle. Uh, you need your teammate. Um, in order to make a go of it, you need them. Absolutely, it's a partnership. Yeah, you need both together. You need to cooperate with each other. You need to trust each other, and you absolutely uh, need to feel like uh, you can depend on the other person, and that they are dependent on you. That they're not going to uh, say, "Well, I don't need you, so I'm leaving." Um, so you work a little harder to maintain the relationship, and you work a little harder to uh, to uh, just be nice to them to appreciate what they do because you're working hard too um, to make it work. You uh, you notice the effort that they're putting in as well. And so I think it like this whole, uh, the affluence that uh, a lot of people enjoy sort of, you know, my boyfriend's friend and his wife who, you know, went back to work part time and but still expects her lifestyle to be accommodated, her chosen lifestyle, but also wants her husband to be available, right? Or he's cut off in the bedroom. And I'm just like, I couldn't even imagine doing that. I couldn't even imagine doing that to my man. Um, you know, if if I wanted to not go back to work, if we had, if I made X amount of dollars and he made X amount of dollars when I met him, right, and I decided you know, we decided we were going to buy a house and have this lifestyle, right, um, based on our combined incomes. I would not. I would either have gone back to my old job, right, and I might have hated it, but I would feel obliged to do it, or I would be the one to suggest that we downgrade our house, mm -hmm. move to our neighborhood, all of that stuff, so that he wouldn't be forced to work 14, 16 hours a day and be out of town all the time. And I certainly, if I felt so entitled as to be able to maintain my lifestyle while cutting my hours in half and cutting my income uh, by two-thirds, right, and he expecting him to make up the balance to maintain the lifestyle, you wouldn't hear a single fucking complaint out of my mouth and you can be guaranteed my legs would be wide open when he walked in the door every night. Well, it's because you actually have respect and understanding, respect for your partner, and understanding that you know he's a human being and that it's a two-way road. It's not; they're not just some pack mules that you can carry everything on. Men have feelings. Men are people. You need to give them respect. Otherwise, you're the piece of shit. You know. Um, and this sort of brings brings it sort of back to the thing I was the point I was trying to make when I brought up the difference in spending on, you know, personal care items where a large portion of what women buy for themselves, and very often with their husband's money, is stuff to pamper themselves and stuff to make themselves feel good about themselves and stuff like that, whereas you know, men are sort of stuck with the practical for the most part. And it's that like women have a degree of entitlement to expect being pampered that, that is like n you would never see a guy just demanding stuff like that. It'd pamper me and not not have him expect to be treated like, you know, some sort of a wimp for it or treated like an asshole for it. Women can be real assholes um, about stuff like this and get away with it. Uh, socially, they do. They have this huge entitlement to this. And it you, you don't really become aware of it as a woman unless you kind of live on the outside of it for a reason. Like I have the, the, the allergy reason where I I end up not, um, you know, not even able if I wanted to, to engage in that entitlement because, you know, I'm allergic to it. Um, but it helps me to notice, like, how much gets spent on that and how much effort and time and thought gets put into that. And how, how that's a lot of energy to be putting into the self that isn't, it's not necessarily functional. Well, yeah, that just reminds me of, uh, you know, what I call Shiva's law because uh, he's the first person I've, I've ever heard use this, uh, you know, like 10 years ago, that everything women say uh, negative about men is actually true of themselves. It is absolute rejection. Not just feminists, just women, period. One of the things that women say uh, en masse about men at large is that, oh, men are just arrogant. Well, no, honey, you are arrogant. You have the ego because that's what entitlement is. It is massive, massive ego. And women, very clearly, majority of women that are of the newer generation too, they have just massive arrogance problems.
Yeah, I think so. I think that any time uh, a woman uh, would want to, would would take something that she didn't earn, right? Like that, that you know, like it's, it's different if it's like a birthday gift or something like that, but to just, you know, accept something that she didn't earn, accept a drink, accept a, you know, a meal, accept whatever um, that, you know, or that she wasn't planning on, uh, like, I, does anybody remember that, um, that one woman she was featured uh, a few years ago in the newspaper? She went on uh, dating sites and uh, essentially got $1,800 in free meals in a year because she, she only would go on first dates and the guy would always buy. And then she would never call him again. And she'd get a new one. And, uh, and so, like, four or five nights a week, she'd be going out to a really nice restaurant and get a free meal. And she was like totally proud of herself. She had like quite the little little scheme going where she never had to pay for her meals. And I, I'm like, what a bitch. Yeah. Right? Because those guys aren't buying you a meal just to be nice. They're buying you a meal because that's part of the traditional courtship ritual. That's not just part of the traditional courtship ritual, you know, in the West or or, you know, since, you know, for the last 4,000 years. That's, that's been the way it's been since maybe as much as 2 million years ago that a male sharing food was one of the ways that he could present himself as a, a partner, as a potential mate for a woman. Um, so you're essentially taking something that's, that's like as old as the hills and and you're using it to like exploit men and get their money and it's just disgusting without giving them anything back. Ugh. Well, yeah, they think it's a it's a given. It's assumed that they're supposed to get it and not actually give anything back. And if anyone tries to imply that, uh, well, no, if you get something, you're supposed to give. Otherwise, you're just a, a taker. They're like, oh, patriarchy. You know, it's it's just really unfortunate that. Um, that thing exists that we could just every, blame everything on uh, men and that men just it's like men are half of the population okay it's like I've been noticing this this new thing uh, where maybe it's not that new I don't know but you have women who traditionally are said that you know they don't really have the looks or or the you know the proper weight or whatnot they will make up for it with their personality and that tended to be true maybe at some point but recently what I've been seeing is women who make up for their uh, lack of attractiveness uh, in the physical sense with a really bitchy personality. It's like, that's not how you make up for it. But of course, we have, you know, feminism sort of emboldening them and saying, well, you know, you don't need to look good for a man and you don't need to act good for anyone. Well, excuse me, men are half of the population. If you want to be attractive to people, then you have to be able to be attracted to in some way. So your shitty personality does not make up for your um, your lack of whatever else, and the only people that are actually okay with it are those women that are just like you, but the rest of us women and the rest of the men, they're like, you're unappealing on every possible level, at least if you were nice, if you were friendly, if you were somehow not a screeching banshee, that would be great, but you're not, you're, ev you're everything that's bad, you're making up for bad things with more bad things. I, I don't understand how that's happening. That's part I of think it's like they feel like they can stiff arm people into doing things their way, or or you know giving them what they want and things like that in life. It's part of it's part of the fat acceptance uh, thing, I think, um, in terms of, um, and this sort of started with Naomi Wolf on, and her book The Beauty Myth, um, with this idea that uh, standards of beauty, what men find attractive in women, physically, are actually a social construct. They are actually, I think Naomi Wolf actually uh, suggested that it was created by the beauty industry um, in order to get money and uh, and all kinds of, and essentially make women self-conscious about their looks, uh, get lots of money out of them, and you know, coming from her who can't leave the house without her hair perfectly teased, this is really hilarious, but um, you know, and, and a full face of makeup, but she, she essentially posited that it was sort of a conspiracy, that women were becoming independent. And the patriarchy couldn't have that, so it, it sort of created this huge myth of actual beauty standards, right, that objectively exist, right? That's a myth. It was just created to preoccupy women with their looks so that they would not achieve 
equality in the boardroom and equality in politics and equality in economic uh, independence and equality in uh, political and social empowerment and all of that because they're too preoccupied with their looks because this beauty myth that was ginned up, I guess, um, by, you know, people twirling their mustaches in a hollowed out volcano, you know, raking in tons of money in wrinkle cream, just figured, oh, well, we can convince, we can brainwash all the women in society that men like a certain waist to hip ratio and men like women who still appear young, even if they're not young anymore, that they still appear young, that, that men prefer this, this body shape and this type of face and symmetrical features and all of this and neotenous features and all of this stuff. That's all a myth, right? That's just brainwashing and, and none of that and, and boobs and stuff. None of that exists, right? None of that is actually objectively part of the human condition. It's all just a social construct designed to keep women down, keep women from... And I'm, I'm just like, I'm thinking about this. Of course, if you swallow that line of reasoning as a fat chick, okay, then you don't think that you have to make up for your fatness with a good personality or sense of humor or, you know, bringing him coffee uh, in the morning or uh, sucking his dick more often than the next chick or whatever. You don't, you don't have to make up for that because you're just as beautiful, objectively, as the next person. It's just everybody else is brainwashed. She's just as entitled to male attention. And, well, of course, Naomi coming out of the house looking all coif, that's because she's doing it for herself, you understand? That's just doing it. She's an empowered woman, and she's just doing it because it makes her feel good. Yeah, you feeling good is people thinking you're attractive, is men thinking you're attractive, and women thinking you're high status because that's what makeup sort of is a lot of times. Yeah. Yes, but and, if you're not the target of that effort, you're not allowed to look or else you're stare-raping her. Right, and on top of that, uh, which is something that kind of leads into the, the Carrie Stem show I'll be doing at the end of the month on HBR, is that um, basically the show is going to be Who Funds uh, Feminism. And uh, one of the interesting things is that in terms of advertising, and there is a, there is a baby in the bathwater. There are uh, some of the earliest advertising efforts were saying, uh, oh, uh, you, you might have halitosis, and nobody's telling you, and they're just all laughing about you behind your back, so you should get Listerine. So it really uh, engaged the, the female social sort of, oh my God, all my friends are actually not my friends and they're all gossiping about me behind my back because I have this breath situation that, that I can't tell I do, but they can tell I have. Oh my God, I totally need to buy this stuff. And so it's like, it's, it is exploiting uh, women in some way, but there's a whole lot of bathwater. There's a tiny, tiny baby and a bunch of bathwater, and I'm ignoring that there is biological fitness. We are human animals. We are attracted to fitness in the animal sort of sense. Our instinct is what does, our feelings does, do not separate us from, from animals. All animals have feelings. It's reasoning. Reasonability and logic is what separates us from animals. We all still have the same instincts. Uh, the, the, why do we like fit women? Why do we like men with muscular shoulders? You know, to, to quote uh, Third Rock from the Sun, as uh, Sally was saying, something about the thickness of your neck and the proportion of, to the width of your shoulders makes me feel like you're going to be a viable partner and provide well for our children. You know, that's exactly the point. Uh, women and men, we're still animals and we appreciate animal fitness in each other and you cannot say that it's a construct. The same as David Raymer, you can't say that his gender was a social construct when it so clearly is rooted in biology. But of course they believe any sort of science is uh, anti-women, I guess. Science is the patriarchy. Yeah. It's a white, it's, it's a, it, science is just a tool of the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Oh my god, dog, go! But, um, yeah, no, I, I just, I find it hilarious that the hoops that they will force themselves mentally to jump through in order to, um, to essentially have all roads lead to misogyny. Um, and, you know, that, that things, uh, things like, beauty standards cannot just exist because they do, right? They, they exist because they do. They, they are what they are because they are, right? And that's it. It's just, it's, it's an is. And, and talking about how things ought to be different um, or trying to pretend that such, these kinds of things are, are in, you know, inherently changeable, right? That we can somehow convince 
every like V has said, you know, uh, like his his dick's like a uh, it's like a tester, right? And if it stands up, then she's beautiful, and if it doesn't stand up, she's not, and that's that's just the way it is, right? Um, that that's like how how can they even convince themselves that that this is all just some grand conspiracy of the beauty industry run by male patriarchs? who are just trying to distract women from actually accomplishing things. It's Wizard's first rule. Um, T Terry Goodkind wrote a book series called Sort of Truth, uh, which got made into a really uh, poorly translated uh, Legend of the Seeker, but it's, it's a fine show by itself. It's just loosely based on Sort of Truth. And uh, Wizard's first rule is that people are stupid. That's the shorthand version. The longhand version is people will believe anything if they A, want it to be true, or B, are afraid it is true. So it is very easy to sort of trick people into believing something if they're afraid of it being true or if they really want it to be true. And I think that's really what's happening. They are circumventing logic and reason and actually, well, a lot of times also because of gender studies and postmodernism that's infiltrating a lot of these things, the humanities. Um, women do not really have a strong grasp on reality, on um, order of events, on, on consequences. That is sort of a male domain more traditionally and because women have completely shut down the male mind and shut them out of their lives and they have, they allow men and male minds absolutely zero effect on their mind. Um, they're lost in, in the world of emotion and feelings and, and nothing is more right than anything else. There's no objective truth. Uh, so that whole postmodernist, uh, you know, suit is what women are wallowing in um, a lot of times, especially in the Western world, and when they don't have reality biting them on the ass, when they don't really have anything uh, to keep them tethered, um, they will just go, you know, believe whatever they want to believe, especially if enough people around them say it's true, as like off, feminism is doing. Off into the weeds they go, yeah, no, and it's, it's, it's absolutely stunning to me, you know, like, because when, you know, I've said before, feminism is like an engine, it's not a pendulum. It's not going to swing back. It's going to keep pushing in one direction forever and ever and ever, and that's the direction uh, of more things for women and who cares about anybody else. And, there, I mean, there are perfectly valid evolutionary reasons that this would be the case, that this, you know, that uh, there are perfectly valid evolutionary reasons why we care about women's safety and well-being even more than we care about children's, right? Because... A child is a child. A woman represents all of the children she can potentially have, right? Which is more than one child. And so, when the way we measure those things instinctively is extremely, uh, it, 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 it favors women. And the, the one thing that has always amazed me is how we can be convinced, given that, uh, given things like the VAWA, you know, women are the least victimized by violence of any de demographic in society, including children, and yet they're the only ones with their own federal legislation just to deal with violence against them. Um, how? And then we think that nobody takes violence against women seriously, and it's normalized by society, and it's it's endorsed by patriarchal cultures like ours. It, what? Like how how on earth can they balance these two things in their heads? that the people who are the most immune from violence have their own very own federal legislation protecting them from violence and at the same time say that society condones and condones violence against women specifically i mean this this is just it blows my mind right that we can think that that there are like millions of people in our society actually think that so yeah we got a lot off topic from like airplane stuff, right? We really have. Uh, it's uh, it's been uh, horror stories of all sorts of types. Uh, but I was just uh, thinking of wrapping it up. If you guys might have any last words on the uh, any don't of the travel eat, or any of that. Don't eat the food on Air Canada. <laughs> oh, and uh, potentially use Expedia because they they've been pretty good to us. Also, I'm assuming I'm assuming that we're waiting until everybody's back before we share tales from the. The trip. Yeah, I think we like probably the actual, so that everybody can conference. Yeah. Talk I also want to say. I also want to say, don't eat breakfast at Heathrow, unless you want to be still shitting through the eye of a needle three days later. <laughs> so that, that's good to know. Yeah. So the breakfast, uh, British breakfast, they have uh, the traditional British breakfast, right? It's got like beans and and like well, ham I'm, and some tomatoes and oh, hearty shit. 
All I had was eggs and sausage and toast. That's all I had. And I don't know what it was that got me. It's probably it, that whole wheat, a uh, whole lot of fiber, actual fiber. I don't know, but oh my god. Yeah, I'm still recovering. It's no good. Uh, Either way, there, there, there was no amount of travel hell that it could take away from how awesome the conference itself was. True. Can't wait to hear your guys' uh, everybody's thoughts on that. And uh, Karen, I, I hope everything comes out okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm finally getting better. That's but, good. Um, um, you're not dead yet. <laughs> not quite. That's, that's a good start. And I just like I to go thank. go for a walk. <laughs> I would, uh, on that note, I would like to thank um, all the shitlords uh, that have uh, pitched in to uh, the fundraiser that you guys were running to actually get you to ICMI, and I'm sure they can't wait to hear all the stories from it. And uh, for future events, and just in general, if you like uh, hearing our voices and our perspective, uh, please feel free to feed the badger. Uh, that is feedthebadger.com or uh, patreon.com slash honeybadgerradio. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there and hearing your opinion and having you be an active sponsor to, uh, to this movement and to, to all of us. As volunteers here on the channel, we uh, appreciate you. And uh, it's the ultimate way to vote with your wallet and to show the world uh, more of what you want to see. And I find it very empowering. Um, things like crowdfunding and Patreon, where you can literally help create more of the things you want to see. And if this is something that you want to see, it's one of those things, please feel free to donate, and uh, we need your help. So feed thebadger.com or patreon.com slash honeybadgerradio. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Well, thanks a lot, everyone, and we will see you next week.